thank you very much, everybody, for joining us today. This is our last event in the seminar series, Intelligent Medical uh, Decision Making seminar series. I really appreciate yet that you joined us today. Today we have Dr. Omer Inon. Dr. Inon is Professor and Linda J. and Mark C. Smith Chair in Bioscience and Bioengineering in the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering, an Adjunct Associate Professor in the Coulter Department of Biomedical Engineering at Georgia Tech. He received his Bachelor's, Master's, and PhD in Electrical Engineering all from Stanford in 2004, 2005, and 2009. From 2009, to 2013, he was the chief engineer at Countryman Associates, uh, audio product, uh, a professional audio manufacturer of miniature microphones and high-end audio products for Broadway theaters, theme parks, and podcast networks. Uh, his research focuses on non-invasive physiological sensing and modulation for human health and performance, and is funded by DARPA, NSF, ONR, NIH, CDC, and industry. He has published more than 300 technical articles in peer-reviewed international journals and conferences, and has 12 issued patents. He has received several major awards for his research, including the NSF Career Award, the ONR Young Investigator Award, and the IEEE Sensor Council Early Career Award. He also received an Academy Award for technical achievement from the Academy of Motion Picture, Picture Arts and Sciences, the Oscars. He is an elected flow of the American Institute for Medical and Biological Engineering, while at Stanford, this, this is the part that I love, while at Stanford as an undergraduate, he was the school record holder and a three-time NCAA All-American in the discussed throw. Thank you very much, Dr. Enon, for joining us. We are really excited to learn from your talk. We are all ears. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the kind invitation. That last part is usually uh, less surprising when people meet me in person because I'm about six foot seven, 330 pounds. So <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah. By Zoom, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> but thank you. Well, yeah. thank you all. I'll go ahead and share my screen. And it really is a pleasure to get a chance to uh, present some of our lab's work to you. And I hope that throughout this presentation, you know, I won't be able to monitor the chat. So please just, if you have any questions, um, Go ahead and jump in at any point. Sorry, I'm trying to move this. Let's see. There we go. Great. If you have any questions, just jump in at any point. And I'd love to chat about any of this stuff with you guys. Great. So I have some disclosures up front. So we have some startups actually that have come out of the lab. So we've founded a couple of startups recently. One is called CardioSense. One is called Arthroba. Um, I'm involved in both of these. And they're, of course, licensing IP out of our lab at Georgia Tech. Uh, we also have other industry sponsored research and patents and IP licensed by industry. So just have to put these disclosures up front. So my lab is focused on non-invasive physiological sensing and modulation, as uh, Dr. Tayebi said. And really uh, what we like to do is take things from end to end in terms of the system design and then work with collaborators on the clinical evaluation and validation of our technologies so that they can then translate into uh, patient care settings. That's our whole premise for the lab. So we start with basic prototyping where we actually build multimodal wearable sensing systems. Uh, we do some optimization and benchtop testing in the lab, but also testing in individuals who are typically healthy in, uh, in our lab here at Georgia Tech as well. We compare it to gold standard measurements of the physiological parameters that we're interested in. And then, of course, we develop algorithms uh, to be able to extract information from these wearable sensors. All of this forms as the basis for where we typically then translate these technologies to clinical settings. We work with many hospitals and uh, clinicians across the U.S. and have deployed many devices in these uh, clinical sites for testing in many patients. And then, of course, this led to startup found, uh, founding and FDA 
in uh, interactions as well. So today I'm going to talk about three different uh, areas that my lab works on. And uh, the first one is really uh, focused on cardiovascular monitoring and specifically on monitoring the mechanical aspects of heart function. The second one will focus on wearable technologies for joint health monitoring. So typically we'll talk about the knee especially. And then the third one is actually some work that we've been doing that focuses on pediatric uh, applications and especially pediatric safety. And it's involving an interesting use of bioimpedance technology, which I'll tell you about, to be able to detect uh, events that can occur when somebody is being treated with intravenous therapy. So I'll start with the cardiovascular monitoring work. And the main motivation for this work for us has been actually the problem of something called heart failure. So heart failure is a very common condition in the US. It affects more than 6 million people. It has a very high mortality rate. Uh, you know, within five years of diagnosis, half of the people with heart failure will end up dying. And it leads to very high costs in terms of, in fact, it is the number one uh, Medicare cost is specifically the heart failure related hospitalization costs. And so if somebody has heart failure, basically the heart is unable to pump enough blood to meet the demands of the organs and tissues of the body. And so you can imagine that this is a very debilitating condition that leads to many hospitalizations, treatment, you know, readmissions, et cetera. And so this is the problem area that has really motivated a lot of our work in the space. So there are now implantable devices that can be used to measure the internal hemodynamics, the characteristics of the cardiovascular system that are associated with worsening condition in patients with heart failure. And for someone who has heart failure, you know, life is unfortunately, you know, for lack of a better analogy, it's kind of like a yo-yo where they get a little bit better, but then they get a lot worse and then they get a little bit better and then they get a lot worse. And so they're constantly bouncing back and forth into the hospital, out of the hospital. And the reason for that is because of the fact that their heart can't produce enough pumping action to get blood to where it needs to go. And the body's typical mechanisms for compensating for that end up actually uh, counterproductive instead of helping the situation. So I'm going to give you kind of the two minute version, but what happens is that the person's body normally, if it retains more blood, retains more fluid, that helps the heart pump more blood out. So basically, if you fill the heart with more blood, the heart is able to pump more blood out to the body. Uh, and so in the case of heart failure, the body's natural response to not getting enough blood to where it needs to go is let's retain some more fluid. Unfortunately, you have a heart that's already weakened and it's unable to even pump out the fluid that is in it in the first place. And so if you start filling it with more fluid, you can imagine that you start getting backflow and that backflow leads to congestion. Congestion means that there's fluid all over the body that's not supposed to be that there's fluid in the lungs, fluid in the ankles, there's swelling. And this is where the person uh, goes through this congestion to the point where they're what's called decompensated and they need to be hospitalized. That's an acute decompensation is an emergency for these patients and they go to the hospital. So there are these implantable devices that can measure internal pressures inside of the body that are indicative of this worsening condition. And as they do so, the person can then change their medications. Specifically, there's these things called diuretics that make you pee out fluid. And so they start taking these medications and increasing the medication dosages to avoid this problem of decompensation. And those implantable devices have worked really well. Uh, so there's a lot of technologies out there for trying to manage heart failure. None of them have really worked except for this implantable approach. CardioMEMS is the main device, but there's other companies like Endotronics that are developing these sorts of devices as well. These are really expensive. For each patient, a surgery to implant one of these devices into what's called the pulmonary artery, which is your way of basically getting a window into how the heart is being filled. Um, these devices cost you know, $25,000 per person. And so there's also this lengthy surgery and they've only been used because of that and maybe tens, 
of thousands of patients with heart failure, not the 6 million that have it. In fact, the math is intractable. If you do 6 billion times 25,000, then you'll have a number that's much, much higher than what we're already spending on heart failure. So it's not possible to do that. Not to mention the complications and the fact that FDA won't allow it. So our objective has been to try to design a non-invasive solution, basically a wearable device with associated algorithms that can still detect the very same thing that these implantable devices are currently detecting. And so that's what's called hemodynamic congestion. And then what you could do is for the rest of these 6 million patients that can't use the implantable technology, they could have this wearable device. The wearable device could allow them to detect when they're congested. They could change their medication doses accordingly. And then you would have a solution that could really impact the quality of life for these patients, as well as reduce the cost of care. So that's what we've been aiming for. This is kind of the high level framework. So you have a device that's on the person. They wear it during their daily life. You know, there's wearable signals that are measured that presumably are related to the hemodynamic parameters you care about. And then these signal processing and machine learning algorithms provide some indication of decompensation status that can then be fed back to a clinician for clinician in the loop control over the condition. So we've started with a technology called seismocardiography for this work. And the reason for that is that the typical wearable sensing solutions that people have used for cardiovascular physiology usually involve things like electrocardiography and photoplethysmography. Those are the most commonly measured signals. Neither of those signals has information, at least directly, that relates to the filling or pumping action of the heart. Some work has shown that you can use, you know, machine learning algorithms to try to inversely kind of pull out information from those signals, but there's nothing direct in terms of the heartbeat. The electrocardiogram is really an electrical portrait of what's going on. The photoplethysmogram is measured peripherally at the finger or the wrist or the ear. And so it's really capturing more of what's happening in those distal locations, you know, with what's happening with the vessels specifically. So it may be of use. ECG may also be of use, but we really needed a signal that has a more direct correspondence to hemodynamics. And so we've built various wearable devices that include seismocardiography on board. In fact, the latest device, and this is the one that, this is the academic version of it, but uh, the company CardioSense that we founded is now trying to commercialize this technology, uh, is basically a wearable patch that sits on the chest. So it attaches to the chest with two ECG type electrodes. If you've ever used these, you'll be very familiar with them. They're basically these sticky uh, pads that go on the skin. They're very thin. They're used for long-term monitoring already in electrocardiography. And so, you know, skin irritation is less of an issue than it would be with custom technologies. And we use actually the snaps from those electrodes uh, on board our device as well to be able to attach to the chest. And then our device has of course, ECG pickup from those electrodes, electrocardiogram pickup. It also has multiple colors of LEDs and, and uh, two photodiodes on board to be able to pick up different uh, wavelengths of photoplethysmogram signals that can allow for SpO2, uh, pulse, oxy pulse oximetry, as well as extraction of these PPG waveforms from the chest. And so this is kind of our multidimensional uh, monitoring platform. The other signal, of course, that it measures is something called the seismocardiogram. That's what our lab really has looked into quite a bit. And of course, Dr. Taibbi is one of the people in that field as well, who's worked on that signal also. That signal represents the vibrations of the chest wall in response to the heartbeat. It's measured with a tiny accelerometer with very low noise floor. And essentially, the name seismocardiogram uh, reflects very well what it is, which is sort of the earthquake of the heart uh, that's measured through the chest, kind of the way you can think about it. So we've done quite a bit of work now over the last, I don't know, almost decade on using these signals in patients with heart failure. This is some of our most promising findings so far, which was something we published in Circulation Heart Failure in 2018. And in this work, what we found was the way that this signal the seismocardiogram looked before and after a standardized exercise task, specifically something called the six minute walk test, which is something that patients with heart failure do 
uh, uh, quite often, demonstrated that the response to this task was very different in patients who were compensated compared to decompensated. Remember, one of our goals is to be able to detect compensation status for patients at home. Basically, when they performed this exercise, the compensated patients were able to change their physiology in response to the exercise task. And we saw basically on the seismocardiogram that there was less similarity in the seismocardiogram signal structure before and after the task. That's what you're kind of looking at on the left side here. These are K nearest neighbor graphs representing the data before and after the six minute walk test. So if we're compensated, the data on the left compared to the data on the right looks quite different. For decompensated patients, we found that the similarity was high. This was something that we quantified with something called the graph similarity score. And we saw a very significant difference between the two groups. Maybe more importantly though, for the same patients who were admitted to the hospital when they were decompensated and then discharged after usually weeks, days to weeks of diuretics being delivered to get rid of the fluid, from admit to discharge, we saw an improvement, basically a reduction in the similarity score for all of the patients. For one of the patients then, they had readmission because of acute kidney injury and volume overload. And for that patient, when they were readmitted, we saw that GSS increased. And for a patient that had heart transplant, we saw that it decreased. And so this was one marker, really the first time from a wearable, that there was a sensitive marker that was indicative of the compensation status of patients with heart failure. So this was super exciting. From this though, of course, like any study, the uh, exciting finding also led to more questions. So we wanted to better understand how these signals corresponded to other measurements that can be taken from patients with heart failure during exercise. And so specifically, we saw some exercise effect crudely in the six minute walk test and we better, wanted to better understand where that effect was coming from. And so what we did was we then took some of the patients, uh, actually a totally different population of patients, but about 70 in this case, and had them perform, perform uh, cardiopulmonary stress testing while they were wearing this wearable patch. And our goal was to try to estimate the key parameters that are measured with the cardiopulmonary stress testing, specifically breath by breath VO2 or oxygen uptake, and we wanted to do that with our seismocardiogram and electrocardiogram signals. So here you see kind of the framework of what's going on. These are the waveforms from a patient performing this cardiopulmonary stress testing. It lasts about 30 minutes, maybe 40 minutes. Uh, you see the ECG on top, you see the SCG signal measured in the middle, and then you see the corresponding VO2 values on the bottom. And so if you zoom in on this, you can actually see the heartbeat by heartbeat ECG and SCG signals that are measured, ECG in blue, SCG in green. And then for each breath, there's a single VO2 value as well. That value comes from this wearable mask. You can see that the person is wearing. So there's a whole exercise uh, characterization equipment that's used in the hospital. That's kind of our gold standard that we're trying to estimate. So from the ECG, we do heartbeat detection, we then have the seismocardiogram below that we segment into heartbeats. With each of those heartbeats, we then have information that can be averaged across these different heartbeats to reduce noise, and then various features that can be derived from these waveforms that we've found in other work to be relevant for the hemodynamics. We then perform a simple random forest regression model to try to estimate each of these VO2 breath-by-breath uh, -breath measures. The model's trained with one group of subjects, about 50 of them, and then it, that it was used basically through a leave one subject out uh, model to be able to train in the first place. And then it was validated uh, or tested, I should say, on a totally different population of 25 patients. We also performed a classification to determine the outcome from the study, which really was this clinical state. Um, and so there's SVM classifier we trained for that. So these are the results on the test set. So this is the entirely unseen test set upon which the model was tested after it was trained and validated on this uh, 50 patient population. So this is a total of 24 subjects uh, that were completely unseen to the model. And you can see that both the correlation uh, with which we're estimating VO2 
values from the device, as well as the ROC curve for the clinical decision, which is stage C versus D, heart failure, were both uh, performing very well with the device and algorithm. Uh, the last study that I'll talk about with this device was something that we performed that really directly addressed the question that we had, which was, can this device detect decompensation? And specifically, does this device allow for waveforms to be captured that correlate to pulmonary artery pressure measurements that normally would require either a catheter inside of the heart or would require a implantable sensor that's placed in the pulmonary artery. So similar kind of methodology where we had concurrent measurements of the gold standard, which was the right heart cath, as well as the SCG and ECG from our device, and where we did beat segmentation. So basically this uh, whole framework is the same as what we've done in our other studies, but the goal was to try to do uh, perform regression to estimate the changes in mean arterial pressure associated with the right heart cath procedure. So we had this right heart, we had this uh, heartbeat detection, outlier removal, and noise reduction again that we've used in our other studies, and then something called dynamic time warping to do some of the uh, feature extraction as well. So these are some of the results again from the test set. So you can see that again we had a fairly strong. I'm sorry, this is for the this is for the uh, overall population, not for the test set, because in this case we only had 20 subjects, so we were not able to do a whole held out. Um, Test said we had to leave one subject out cross validation. So these are the results that we obtained, and and these were exciting, and these are really the basis for uh, the FDA breakthrough designation that was obtained uh, for CardioSense, the company, uh, which is basically this kind of FDA saying that this device may have a potential for uh, uh, significantly improving quality of life and actually dealing with life threatening disease, which in this case is heart failure. So I'm going to move on now to our work on knee health monitoring with wearable technology. And, uh, you know, similar to heart failure, this is a big problem. It's different in its nature. And so, you know, rather than being something that's kind of an end of life sort of situation, it's really more uh, that people endure knee injuries because of sports or just normal, you know, daily living activities and that people have knee pain because of arthritis. So these are really the two things that can be addressed. And the knees are not only one of the most injured body parts, but they also account for the most severe injuries. So if you have an ACL tear, for example, and you're an athlete, you know, you may miss nine months to 12 months of activity. And then after that injury, in fact, you have about a seven times higher risk of being re-injured after you get back to your activities especially if you get back too early. So, you know, a knee injury is nothing small. It's definitely something that can be very debilitating. Uh, one of the things that I was excited about, I mean, you, you heard from my bio that I also worked in industry and the miniature microphone space. And so when I came to Georgia Tech, uh, I attended this DARPA PI meeting on this program where they identified the need for better wearable technologies for assessing uh, joint health. And I thought about the fact that, you know, acoustics are super interesting. Actually, if you uh, if you've ever done machining yourself, then you'll know that as the machine is, let's say, with a CNC or something, if you're drilling holes or you know performing some operations, so let's say take out some material, you know that just by hearing sounds of that operation, you can kind of tell what's going on. If there's something that's uh, rattling too much, then that may be an issue. You know, same thing with your engine. If you're a car person, I'm not. <laughs> but with the knees, you have these surfaces that are constantly rubbing against one another. And as they do so, you would imagine that there's friction and friction leads to sound. And so that this is sort of called tribo, tribo, uh, tribology, right? So we were interested in the measurement of acoustics from the knees with wearable technology. And our kind of underlying hypothesis was that the characteristics of the sounds generated by the joints may relate to the underlying health of those joints. So we had a vision for that, and we kind of pursued that vision over the last nine years here at Georgia Tech. We've gone through many different 
prototypes. This is one of the later ones that we used in clinical settings to capture the sounds from the joints with these tiny contact accelerometers uh, that sit onto the, onto the knee, basically in the soft spaces around the knee. And they capture the acoustics from the joint through the vibrations of the skin that result from those acoustic emissions. Uh, we then have uh, machine learning algorithms to derive information from these uh, sensor data that can give us information about joint health. And so these are a couple of the other prototypes that we built. We have a few different sensing modalities on board, so I'll kind of point them out here. So, of course, we have the contact microphones, which are basically wideband accelerometers that go right onto the knee and the soft spaces around the, around the kneecap. And then we also have a couple of electrodes here and here from which we measure something called bioimpedance through the joint as well. And bioimpedance is basically a electrical measurement of the impedance of biological tissue, in this case, the knee. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. And then we measure as well the kinematics of the joint. We have basically inertial measurement units here and here, and we have a temperature sensor as well to measure skin temperature. All of this, the goal of this is to be able to assess the health of the knee in a variety of different uh, disease and injury models. So these are kind of the details on the embedded systems. Uh, there's a paper that gets into the into more depth on this. We collaborated with Mazi Adamati's group from Northwestern uh, Hospital on this hospital system. And one of the things we did, so sorry, in the next few slides, there's going to be some cadaver uh, photos, I think, uh, because one of the things we had to do was to understand the basic science of what we're measuring so that we can better understand what that measurement can correspond to. So some of the first studies we did actually were in uh, cadaver knees, and these are fresh frozen cadavers, so the mechanical characteristics of the tissue and knee are very well preserved compared to humans uh, who are alive, basically compared to in vivo models. And the concept was that with cadavers, we could actually induce an injury and look at the signals before and after the injury to see how they changed. So that was the concept. So we had this cadaver limb, it was mounted to the table, a person would actuate it with their arm, which is of course different than actuating with the muscles internally, but it's close enough. Um, and then we actually sutured the accelerometers to the skin because of the fact that then there would be no motion artifact between the accelerometer and the skin. And then with the study, what we did specifically was I had an MD PhD student who's now a, a orthopedic resident at University of North Carolina. And he was super interested in, in all aspects of the project, of course. And now that's, you know, that's a career he's going into. He's an MD PhD. So um, he was the one who actually would perform these surgeries on the cadavers where he'd open up the joint space. He would go in and create a medial meniscus tear uh, kind of what's shown here on the right side, which is one of the most common injuries that can occur acutely to the knee. Uh, and it's a structural defect. So we envisioned that this would change the way that the knee would sound as it was as it was moved around. And in fact, it did. So we had basically baseline condition here on the left with no tear, sham condition where we opened up the joint capsule but did not create a tear in the meniscus. Meniscus tear is the third sort of uh, panel here and the meniscectomy is the fourth panel. Meniscus tear and meniscectomy didn't really have a major difference in the sounds, but the meniscus tear and meniscectomy compared to sham and baseline were quite different. So specifically, many features showed differences between these groups, but one of the features we looked into specifically was something called the B value, which is used in acoustic emission monitoring of beams and structures in other applications. And so we wanted to basically borrow this um, this feature to see if it also reflected the health of the joint in, in uh, health of the structure in the case of the knee. The other thing that we noticed actually in our first studies of even healthy subjects was that the knee produced different sounds depending on the loading conditions. So if a person performed seated flexion extension of the knee, the sounds associated with that looked pretty different than a person performing squats, for example, where their whole body weight was on top of the knee. Um, and so we wanted to investigate that in more detail. So we performed these uh, experiments with vertical leg press where we actually increased the weight 
that the person was pushing. Um, and it basically went from 0% to 50% to 100% of body weight. And with that, how do I get rid of this panel up here? Okay. Sorry. How do I get rid of this? Uh, we don't we don't see that. Uh, oh, you I'm don't. Sure. Okay, great. Yeah. Perfect. All right, then I'll leave it then. It's just the thing from the top was coming down and sitting there. <laughs> All right, it's gone now anyways. So, um, so what we wanted to do was we wanted to characterize how these sounds from the knees changed as you uh, affected the weight that the person was pushing into for the same controlled activity. And you can see on the right that even visually there's big differences at you know zero percent body weight, fifty percent body weight, hundred percent body weight in the sounds observed from the knee. And while that was interesting on its own and may have some applicability to uh, monitoring load of the knee that can sort of tie into other spaces, what got us most excited about that was actually that the source of that change in sounds was likely the change in friction internally in the joint. As you push the surfaces together more with more vertical loading, that's going to increase the friction that uh, is perceived internally. And we believe that that was the reason for uh, that was the reason for the change in the sounds. So one of the other things that can change the friction inside of the joint is something called synovitis, which is what is experienced by patients with rheumatoid arthritis, with juvenile idiopathic arthritis. It's basically the inflammation of the synovial membrane that causes swelling of that membrane and basically packs in the spaces around the joint more and also can then rub against the surfaces of the joint. And so we thought that maybe this technology could also then be used for monitoring inflammation level in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. So we deployed some of our braces at the University of Minnesota. There was a group that was funded by the same DARPA program as us and they were very interested in neuromodulation therapies for rheumatoid arthritis. That's Hubert Lim and Eric Peterson. And so they were already running a clinical trial on patients with rheumatoid arthritis. And we basically teamed up with them to deploy our technology in that trial as well and see if we could track the changes in clinical status that they would be measuring with all of their gold standard measures. And so this is the main result that came out of that study. Uh, basically, we were able to classify the disease activity in patients with rheumatoid arthritis using just the sensors on our knee brace. And this is for 10 subjects, five visits per subject, so 50 data points total. Uh, it was formed with a leave two subjects out model where we basically estimated the systemic inflammation level uh, from the joint sounds and we assessed the uh, disease activity level using that estimate of systemic inflammation together with local estimates of swelling and range of movement degradation and it ended up being a pretty accurate model for disease activity we've done similar work in kids with juvenile arthritis where again using the sounds we were able to classify whether somebody had juvenile idiopathic arthritis or whether they were a healthy control this is easier in kids because kids who are healthy controls have very little sounds coming from their joints actually so uh, it ends up being a pretty big difference when somebody has arthritis in their kid. The difference especially was uh, easier to detect in loaded activities, so squats compared to flexion extension, which was really cool. So the last thing I'm going to touch on here, and then I'd love to take any questions. Of course, if you have questions during as well, you can jump in, is some of the work we've done in IV infiltration detection. So. This has been a project that has been super collaborative from the start. It was uh, a project that basically was a collaboration between my lab at Georgia Tech and Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, which is about 20 minutes away in Atlanta here. And we also involved a couple of other entities called GCMI and T3 Labs. And what's cool is that at Georgia Tech and Children's, there's this pediatric technology center. And with that, there's opportunities for uh, for funding to go to these sorts of projects. And so everything kind of stemmed out of that seed funding. So we have a great team. We have people who are on the clinical side, on the Georgia Tech side as well. And uh, we've been able to do some cool stuff in this area. So many of you have probably had IV therapy, especially if you've gone to the hospital at all. Uh, if you haven't, you probably have a family member who's had IV therapy, so you're probably familiar with this. Basically, IVs are these uh, 
uh, it's a therapy where you put a catheter needle into the vein to be able to deliver fluid or nutrients to the body directly. And it's used in 83% of patients uh, in hospitals in the US. One of the complications, unfortunately, that can occur, and this is actually the most common failure for IVs, is something called infiltration or extravasation. And it really, both are the same physical thing, but infiltration is with uh, what's called non-vesicant solutions and extravasation is with vesicant solutions, which are basically these um, chemically kind of caustic uh, fluids that can actually start doing a lot of damage to the tissue surrounding the vein. So in infiltration or extravasation, what happens is instead of the fluid going into the vein as it's supposed to, for one reason or another, the fluid starts leaking into the extravascular space, so into the tissue rather than to the vein. And this can happen because the needle actually breaches the lining of the vein. It can happen because the chemicals from the fluid actually eat through the lining of the vein, or it can happen because the person moves around quite a bit, and so the needle can then come out of the vein into the extravascular space. And basically, this is something that not only happens in kids but adults but of course it happens more often in kids and it's more severe when it happens in kids and there's different grades of infiltration i'm not going to get into too much detail on this but basically a grade one or two infiltration is where you get a little bit of fluid in that extravascular space and it can basically go away with just observation over 24 hours so in this case which this is something that happens 10 to 25 percent of the time especially for kids you have to have the person stay in the hospital longer than they were going to otherwise. And it ends up still costing some money to the hospital and also being, of course, painful and uncomfortable for the, for the kid. Grade three or four infiltration is really a big problem. I mean, both of these are medical emergencies, by the way, but in grade three and four, you have 48 hours of observation. Many times they have to give an antidote. Uh, if there's a specific type of fluid that leaked out that can be really bad for the tissue, they might have to do surgery to open up the tissue and allow the fluid to leak out. I mean, if somebody has an infiltration and the IV infusion rates are high enough, you can imagine that their whole arm or leg may balloon out of control to the point where you have irreversible tissue damage. So our concept is that we can detect these infiltrations as early as possible, avoid the tissue swelling and damage and allow the person to get out of the hospital quicker without these sorts of things. Uh, occurring. So existing approaches are kind of twofold. Of course, the most commonly used one and really the one that's, uh, you know, a predominant super majority of cases used is nurse and caregiver observation. Basically, the nurse or caregiver will go and check the site once every hour, sometimes once every two hours, depending on how many, you know, how well the hospital is staffed and how well people follow the procedures. And these frequent checks are kind of difficult, of course, for caregivers and, you know, with COVID and with other sorts of things recently that many hospitals are understaffed as well. So it's kind of a challenge and a burden for them. Uh, it's also still subjective when they go and check because they have to go and basically feel the site compared to the other side of the body. And, you know, it's not that difficult. In some cases, like the operating room, the site of the IV is uh, covered by a drape. And so it's not even really possible to check it uh, like this. So those are some of the challenges there. There is also a technology that's out there that's been commercially available since 2015. It involves fiber optics and the measurement of the optical properties of the tissue site. It's really expensive. It's about, I think, $15,000, $20,000. I don't know the exact number, but it's pretty high. Each case is also several hundred dollars. Uh, and it's 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 kind of expensive and, and it's bulky as well. So we've been working on this technology. This is kind of the latest prototype on not a real baby, but kind of a uh, doll from the lab that we use for this sort of purpose to visualize kind of how small infant can be and then how small our device is at this point as well. So this is a device basically that adheres, oops, adheres to the skin using ECG type electrodes, but pediatric ECG electrodes. So they're pretty small. Each of these is about one centimeter by one centimeter in its uh, size. This is the IV site with the normal wound dressing that would go over it. And you can see two of the electrodes are distal to the IV site. Two of the electrodes here are proximal to the IV site. 
and there's actually this uh, sort of flexible plastic that carries the electrical signal from these uh, sensors to the box, which has all the electronics. The box includes um, local storage via SD card, but also it has uh, Wi-Fi to be able to send the data remotely to an app that can allow for visualization and storage. So we did some work early again with the animal model to make sure that uh, what we were measuring was indeed uh, appropriate. We also were looking into different sensing technologies at that time, including strain gauges. We ended up finding that bioimpedance was the best way to detect uh, these infiltration events. And so what we did basically was we first did a baseline case for the pig where the saline was actually infused into the vein. And then the uh, IV catheter was moved. So the saline was started to starting to uh, be infused into the surrounding tissue, first at two milliliters, then five milliliters, then 10 milliliters, and another 10 milliliters. And what we found was by the time we infused 10 milliliters, we definitely, we had a significant difference in uh, the signal and specifically the resistance of the tissue that was measured uh, in the vein and also in the extravascular space. And by the time, of course, it got to 20 milliliters, it was even easier to detect. And for the orange, you can see that's the in-vein bioimpedance changes. There was really no change at all that was perceptible. So this was the first prototype we built. Of course, the newer one is smaller, it's sort of sleeker, but this was the one that allowed us to do our first clinical studies. We filed for um, IP on this as well. So we have patent, issued patent on this technology and really it's a combination of bioimpedance together with other uh, contextual measures to be able to assess the uh, status, IV status locally with the wearable device. And so we've done some work actually in patient studies now as well, uh, where on the left, basically you'll see here what the patient data looks like for a control case. So you do get changes in bioimpedance just normally throughout the recording because of the fact that there's movement, there's changes in skin temperature, there's changes in blood flow. And so there's other things that can confound it. But what you'll see on the bottom here is when you do have an infiltration, which in this case started here, and was detected by the clinician here, you can see there's a huge change in bioimpedance downward that's continuous and keeps going until that infiltration is detected. And that really is our marker for how we detect these things. And with that, uh, with basically that biophysics-based model, we're able to get an AUC of about 0.95 with a total of 60 patients, five infiltrates, and almost 700 hours of, of data. Cool. And so that's that's really all I have. You know, we have a great group with students, postdocs that are funded by our generous uh, funding agencies and, of course, collaborators kind of all over that have helped us to get this work done. And with that, hopefully we'll have some time for questions and discussion as well. Thank you so much for the great talk. I really appreciate it. We have uh, a few uh, really good questions i believe here so i'm going to uh i think it's better if if i just ask them to uh, ask their questions themselves rather than me just reading them so yeah. uh joshua joshua said uh are you still here if you are here please go ahead and unmute and ask your question. Hello? Yes. Hey. hey, I had a question regarding the wearable patch tick hardware. Um, so how does daily activity and movement not create noise and abnormalities in the seismography signals? Great question, great question. So. Activity does actually affect the signal. So the person's moving around that causes artifacts in the measurement. Um, one of the things that we do to deal with that that's worked pretty well is because of the fact that we have an ECG as well on the device, ECG signals are less affected by motion noise than seismocardiogram or other mechanical measures. And so with the ECG, what we do is we actually detect when the heartbeats are occurring. And then with that, we can use averaging and other sophisticated uh, 
more sophisticated techniques like empirical mode decomposition and these sorts of things to be able to reduce some of those artifacts. Practically speaking, also, a lot of these measurements don't have to necessarily be taken during exercise. They can be taken before and after movement. So the other possibility is we can detect when the person is still and get our measurements at that time as well. But that's a really good question. Okay, and uh, we have a question from uh, John Jones. Are you, John, if you are here, please go ahead and unmute and ask your, your question. So, um, I thought it was interesting about the knee cadaver, like you're using the cadavers for the knee device. Um, what differences did you account for, if any, when working for the cadavers with the live patients? And did they produce like similar sounds with the knee devices? Yeah, yeah. So we ended up doing a uh, in vivo study as well that included patients with meniscus tears, and some of the same characteristics were observed in both populations. Although the same feature, this B value didn't exactly work well in the uh, patient population because of the fact that I think the the measures are just more um, they're noisier, they have a lot more complexity to them in the patient population than they do in the cadaver model, and because we don't have really a before and after for the same person, instead we have populations, you know, so there's intersubject variability in the signals that can't be accounted for in that situation. Um, the main difference, though, is the fact that when you actuate your joint, you're using your muscles. And so there's some, you know, co-contraction of muscles that can occur. And so there could be some loading, effectively vertical loading forces that are experienced by the joint in that scenario that aren't there in the cadaver scenario. So there are definitely challenges, but um, but it ended up being very instructive in terms of what we end up measuring afterwards. Like we could tell that meniscus tear led to these high frequency, loud artifacts in the signal, whereas uh, you know those were very different than what we were observing in arthritis and other populations. Okay, thank you. And uh, Arrington, Arrington Ervin. Say again. Uh, er Ervin. Arrington Irvin, uh, can you go ahead and oh, sorry, sorry. ask? Yeah, ask your question. <laughs> yeah, sorry, that that's me. Uh, yeah, hey, how you doing? Um, Good. Yeah, my question. Uh, yeah, so sorry. Uh, when measuring the sounds of the knee during the exercise, I believe it was one of the previous topics you were just talking about. Um, how are you able to discern or like categorize the sound made by each patient's knee? Um, like where the sounds different amongst each patient, like how are yeah. you able to yes. like, group when yes. it's doing a certain type of exercise versus a different type of exercise? Yeah, so this is one of the one of the biggest challenges with this technology and also the cardiomechanical signals is the variability across people in the way the signals look. And so the best possible scenario is the reason why I think wearable makes a lot of sense is if you have that person as their own control and you're measuring changes over time. So if, for example, you have a patient with arthritis and they receive some therapy that changes their status and you want to know how they responded to that therapy, now the patient is their own control rather than the patient being compared against the population. So I think that the promise of these sorts of technologies in that area, monitoring changes in disease activity, monitoring changes in inflammation for a given person over time is more promising than say diagnostics, where you wanna know, you know, you wanna measure joint sounds from a person and you wanna know if they have an injury or not, right? So that's, I think, less of a uh, target market going forward, if that makes sense. And we have a question from Mary Evans. Are you here, Mary? Yes, I'm right here. Okay, please uh, ask your question. Um, I have a question about like the knee device and like the temperature sensors. Is that as the external temperature of the knee like a major variable that determines the knee health? Yeah, I mean, the temperature measurement, we haven't used it yet at all, but there is data in, um, where people have used temperature measurements to assess inflammation and arthritis with um, IR cameras and that kind of thing. So more like standoff measures. Uh, but if you have inflammation, you do have local heating at the site. And so, you know, you may, uh, 
imagine that there might be a change in temperature, but it's difficult. I honestly don't know if that will end up being a useful uh, measure or not. It's not something we have focused on much. Uh, and uh, uh, okay, so uh, I, I'm, I have one question before I I look at other questions. So uh, I saw in in some of your slides you showed SCG signals in three directions, mm. uh, especially the the towards the last you know uh, studies that you showed on SCG. Uh, did you find diagnostic information in all three directions, or did you mainly focus on one direction? Uh, so, uh, yeah, we've done. That's a great point. That's a great point. We've done both. Uh, we've been looking more into the other directions more recently, especially since we have used a lower noise accelerometer now that allows for those directions to have more reproducible waveforms. Um, we did find actually for the uh, for the pulmonary artery pressure estimation work that the lateral axis, so side to side, had a lot of useful information actually, which was kind of surprising because that's not the direction for SCG. So I do think there's value to looking at all three axes for sure. Awesome, great, thank you. Uh, so, and we have a question from Macy right back. Are you here? Um, yes, I'm here. Uh, I just have a question about the IV infiltration. So, why is it seen more commonly in kids and adults? Like, what makes oh. kids more susceptible to that? Great, great question. Sorry, I didn't even uh, mention that. So, the reason is that that there's a, several reasons actually. One is they move around a lot, right? You know. Second one is that their veins are small, and so the lining around the vein is thin, and so you can breach it more easily. The third one is actually they just complain less, so they can have an infiltration and, you know, an adult may call the nurse and say, hey, what's going on here? Something is weird. A kid, especially a baby, may not say anything, right? And so they might cry and you don't know why they're crying. And so that's kind of, that's another issue why it becomes more severe also. And then just, you know, babies or kids are small and so smaller amounts of fluid can make for more severe infiltrations as well. So that's a problem. There's kind of a multitude of, of issues that lead to that. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, definitely. Great question. Okay, great. Uh, I believe we we are done with the questions. Is there, is there any other question? Guys, you can either uh, unmute and ask your question or uh, send your question in uh, the Question box here. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Inan. It was really interesting and exciting to hear about all of these projects uh, using non-invasive sensing, uh, sensing on the body surface. Th that is an area that I'm really passionate about and I, I really enjoy working in that area. And it was really uh, a very good start for my day today to hear firsthand really exciting research projects from one of the guys that I was always looking at uh, following his research. So thank you so much for your time joining us today. Of course, of course. Now, thank you and keep doing great work. I mean, I thank you for having me here and for the really kind words. Thank you so much. And thank you everybody for joining us today. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye guys. Thank you. Thanks for the great questions. Thank you.